Welcome to Transparency with uh, Zeb King. And today I'd like to welcome to the show Mr. Todd Littman. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Zeb. And uh, for our viewers who may not know you, uh, uh, I, I, my bio of you includes that you are uh, the executive director uh, of uh, the Victoria Transport Policy Institute, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, I, I've read uh, uh, an expert in transportation issues. Um, mm -hmm. And so we'll, I'm hoping this will be a useful conversation and, and of, of interest to viewers uh, on the mm -hmm. topic uh, that you're an expert in. Mm -hmm. Great. And so, um, and I know as a municipal councillor since 2002 in central Saanich that I would say transportation uh, is one of the issues that never seems to go away. And I'm mm -hmm. talking about parking, uh, speeding, mm -hmm. uh, volume of traffic. It's mm -hmm. something that's the most common concern, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've, you would agree with? Or? Absolutely. So um, transportation includes all kinds of facilities and activities that affect just about every aspect of life and of the way our communities are designed and function. So um, in you, one, the positive way to say it is more efficient uh, transportation can help solve a lot of different problems that mm. communities face. That's a really good point. We'll probably get to that. Uh, through the conversation. That's right. Uh, and I'm thinking, uh, you've also written a book, I believe, well, probably more than one book that I'm not familiar with, but, but at least I know of one on parking. That's right. And, and uh, also you write quite a bit of uh, research papers on mm -hmm. transport, uh, transportation topics. Mm -hmm. I think you have one new one out. Is, is it called Selling uh, Smart Growth? That's right. Uh, February 2017, I think it came out. That's it's, right. So yeah. that's one of my newer studies okay and um, it highlights some research that I and others have done looking at the direct benefits to residents and to businesses and to local governments or local municipal governments from uh, creating more compact and multimodal communities where people don't have to own as many cars. So what is smart growth? That would be a question for many people. That's uh, right. Yeah, and, and so are you able to help us understand? Sure. Yeah, sure. So smart growth is a general term for creating communities where you can get around without a car. So that, that includes a lot of different components. Um, a lot of it is land use. So it's making sure that people, uh, that a lot of people are able to live close to services. So um, uh, a good indicator is asking what portion of children are able to walk to school. So when I was growing up, the vast majority of children walked to school. About 80% of children walked to school. In a typical suburban or rural community, it's down to less than 20%. So a, a major portion, in fact, mo in most North American communities, most children are chauffeured to, cho to school. Oh, yeah. That's quite common here, yeah. Absolutely. So what's <clears throat> changed? Do children now have fewer feet than they used to? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> no, no. The number of feet has not declined. Right. Right. What has changed? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's the, the living patterns? That's right. Well, the land use patterns. Sure. So the portion, if, if you think of a traditional, say, a small town or a small village, or an urban neighborhood, yeah. um, this, the, the local schools were the center of the community. Is there also a fear factor increasing? Well, it's sort of, uh, that's largely uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. If most children are walking to school, then the children who walk to school are pretty safe. They're looking out for each other. Um, mm -hmm. there, uh, there are lots of, there are usually lots of parents that are involved in this walking. They're, they're walking with, some of them are walking with the children, especially the younger children. And, um, and the, the, the motorists are, are very conscious of that there will be children around. So if, if, if there are lots of children walking to school and, or I should say, if lots of people are walking in a community, um, the community tends to be much safer. 
Now, if what you're, you're asking about is, is there a perception of stranger danger? Is there a, much, exactly. is there a concern yeah, about yeah, stranger yeah. danger? And with the news you're, coverage, you're, et cetera. You're absolutely right, yeah. and it's a great example of, um, of exaggerated fear. The chance of a child being kidnapped and, or, or harmed by a stranger is, all, is tiny. The much greater chance is the child being uh, injured or killed in a car crash. And um, the, in the communities where, uh, in, in a traditional walkable community, or what we could call a smart growth community, uh, a place where a major portion of trips are made by walking and bicycling in public transit, traffic accident rates go way down. So, so um, the, 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 the accident rate, the per capita traffic fatality rates in a traditional urban neighborhood mm -hmm. or a traditional small town is about a quarter of what it is in an automobile dependent sprawled area. Well, I, I, that's very interesting and, and uh, I, I know you know your stuff, but even more than that, there, I think on your website you have numerous documents that people can look at. Sure. Uh, the Victoria Transport Policy Institute that's right. website that's right. and you so can find any, more information there. That's right. So yeah. anything that I say tonight, sure. if somebody's interested in finding out more, just visit our website. But I did want to get back to one of the other yeah. points that we make in, in this study called Selling Smart Growth. And yeah, that right. is households are constantly making trade-offs between housing costs and transportation costs. So frequently, like when you're, when you're buying a house or, or deciding where to rent a house, or um, in some cases, the same with businesses, when a business is trying to decide where to, where to locate, you can, you can find cheaper real estate in a more isolated, automobile-dependent location, or you can pay more for the same size house or apartment or whatever, or, or business, in a more central location. Sure. So it's one of the basic principles of urban economics is this trade-off between uh, what you call accessibility or transportation costs and real estate costs. Okay, so in a typical situation, a household, let's say your, your total transportation and housing budget is, say, $30,000, and you can either taking into account total housing costs, so your mortgage, your, your um, you know, insurance, and your, your um, uh, uh, property taxes, and you know, everything, your basic utilities. Let's say you could either spend um, $20,000 on housing and $10,000 on transportation, or 20, in, if you're located, if you choose one of the suburban houses, or you could pay more. You're going to have to pay $25,000 a year for a more expensive house that's in, let's say, in the closer to the city or, or in a downtown, in, a, in, a, in one of the uh, uh, traditional urban neighborhoods like, say, uh, uh, Fernwood or Fairfield. You'd pay more for the house, but you're saving $5,000 on transportation. Mm -hmm. So you would say, the typical household would say, in the looking at it in the short term, it's a wash. I'm paying $30,000, either $20,000 for housing and $10,000 for transportation in the suburbs, or $25,000 a year for housing, but only $5,000 a year for transportation because I only need one car. I'm saving on my transportation costs. Okay, in the short term, it's, it's a wash. But in the long term, investments in real estate accrue equity where investments in cars and fuel, they depreciate. There's almost that, no value. That, that's something that I've mentioned before as well. That's right. So, council. so the yeah. household that spends more of their budget sure. on housing after 10 years, so instead of buying a 25, or say a $250,000 house yeah. out in the suburbs, you buy the $350,000 house in, say, Fairfield, or a Squamalt, you're paying more for the house. After 10 years, the more expensive house has accrued $65,000 additional equity 
fascinating. Yeah. Your household is wealthier because you're spending more of your household budget on housing and less on transportation by choosing the smart growth location. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about that in a bit about uh, mm -hmm. uh, transportation options as a strategy to um, to to help people reach affordability because we often talk about affordable housing but we right. very rarely look at the affordable transportation uh, as right. a strategy whether I suppose it's in an urban context or even in a suburban context That's or right. a rural context but but just before we go there mm -hmm. I wanted to bring us to a more regional uh, because we've, we've got these papers that talk about smart growth and, and the mm -hmm. principles of smart growth strategy and mm -hmm. and seven I believe seven municipalities have objected to the current regional growth strategy central Saanich being one uh, and uh, that article uh, quotes you a bit in in mm -hmm. terms of some of the concerns uh, uh, with the proposed regional growth strategy as it is now. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns that some municipalities have expressed is that uh, uh, extending water services enables urbanization, enables mm -hmm. urban sprawl. Mm -hmm. And I think the regional growth strategy is, is uh, trying to address mm -hmm. that problem and, and contain growth, uh, mm -hmm. probably trying to promote smart growth. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with the concern that if you extend water out to rural areas, it enables uh, uh, urbanization? Or right, you yes, do? there yeah. are good concerns. So let's let me just sure. be sure the audience understands. Absolutely, is yeah. that um, a traditional rural development pattern is dispersed enough that every virtually every household can have its own well and its own septic system. And they're not close enough that you're contaminating, that the septic system is contaminating the well. And so if you have large parcels, um, then that functions. But as uh, denser development occurs, um, that uh, basic rural infrastructure starts failing. You start getting too much uh, too many septic systems per well. And so, and also in some areas of, of this region, either the well water is inherently um, undrinkable, it has high uh, heavy metals, or uh, there just isn't, it isn't, the wells are not reliable year round. Um, and I think that's a, that's a sign that the, the residential development is getting too dense. If the, if the basic, um, if, if, the, if the normal well water system is, can't accommodate development, that could be a sign, that's a good sign that, that, that development shouldn't occur there. And so uh, it is very tempting for rural property owners to continually subdivide their property. You know, you buy a farm at, you know, it might be, what, five hectares or something like that. And in the temptation, it, you, it starts off as a farm, but the tempt, or, or, or a wood lot or whatever. But the temptation is to keep subdividing that and selling off parcels as residential. And that is sprawl. That is the classic mechanism by which you have more and more people who aren't traditional rural residents. They're, they're people who are moving to rural areas, but they're expecting urban type services. And then they start complaining mm. when they've moved out to what's essentially farmland, and then they complain that the roads are too narrow, they complain that the water, the well water is is undrinkable. They complain that the the the, the sewage, you know, the, their their septic systems are failing because it, there's too much density of septic systems. There's or they have a right to water, so well, pipe water out to their home. That's yeah. right. And so in this in this particular case, there are people whose whose well water, whose wells cannot serve, cannot provide water year round during during you know the summer when it's not raining very much. They complain that they're having to hire a water truck to deliver water and they're actually invoking um, the, um, the United Nations um, um, uh, what is it there uh, right to water, right to water okay. which 
as far as I'm concerned, is a gross misrepresentation of, of that right. I mean, certainly the fact that they have to hire a water truck to deliver their water a few months out of the year is not really a proof that we're depriving them of water. And it brings it back to this, to this more fundamental question, is it really good strategic policy to keep continually um, expand urban type services into lower density rural areas in order to provide urban services in areas that traditionally don't have it. And there, there are good, the, if, if we want efficient development, we would accept those constraints. We would not continually expand roads and water systems and septic systems into, existing, into the existing rural areas. We would, we would say that's a constraint on development. Let's focus the development in the existing urban areas. Interesting, yeah, and, and I wonder if this would tie in as well. Central Saanich is a mix of, of mm -hmm. I think so, there's some urban areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you've got, San, and you've got Saanichton. Saanichton and Brentwood Bay. And Brentwood Bay, yeah. Uh, and, and of course then there's uh, Sydney, which is not part of Central Saanich, but it's also very fairly urban. But right. we're surrounded by farmland and rural lands, and, right. and uh, it's my hope, and I think others, that we would continue to have that farmland and that right. those rural lands. Right. Um, but uh, recently Central Saanich has asked for a very small uh, increase in service from transit uh, mm -hmm. in partnership with Sayout First Nation, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, doesn't get very much service at all for transit. Um, and what is a bit frustrating is that we tend to see uh, any new money coming from senior government get sucked up very quickly for the problem uh, spots, you could call problem child of the region, uh, you know, the areas where there's most congestion uh, as a result of, of rapid growth uh, in those areas. So you have rapid growth, bottleneck of, of traffic. When transit has a little bit of money, uh, it, it throws it at that problem. Uh, and the peninsula, which arguably has had a bit more of a responsible, I would argue, um, uh, approach to uh, smart growth, for example, uh, not this sort of anything goes and we just develop uh, uh, and cause problems for other areas. Um, I, I, we don't see that uh, investment necessarily coming to our community. So does that mean uh, if you go down that road of, of, of not having following smart growth, you end up getting the funds uh, for, for increased transit. Well, you know, I, it's sort of perverse in a way. Well, there yeah. are, there, there are some real challenges. Um, the, the, the basic problem is that the demand for public transit has been growing significantly. Sure. So um, there, for, for all kinds of very good reasons, more people want to live in transit rich areas and use transit. Um, so, and, and including, like you say, in central Saanich, you know, there are people that want to use public transportation. Uh, either they don't drive or, um, or they, 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 they don't want the stress of driving. You know, so some people uh, own a car, but they would just as soon um, uh, use public transit rather than drive during rush hour. So there are all kinds of good reasons that people want to use public transportation. But f the funding has not grown. Right. There is a major crisis because the provincial government did not uh, implement the requested funding, new funding. And so service per capita, that is the amount of, of bus operating hours in the Victoria region, are declining. And um, so... There are some plans, there are lots of very good plans to improve transit service and to have more bus lanes so the bus, buses won't get stuck in traffic congestion, to have uh, some, deploy some new technologies. There's, there are some very good plans, mm -hmm. but there's no funding. Even though uh, the provincial government was able to find funding for expanding 
you know, improving the highway intersection at McKenzie and, um, and put in um, uh, roadway improvements on the Pappy Highway. So um, the, the, the concern that I have is that our funding mechanisms are really designed to favor automobile transportation and they haven't been updated in response to changing demands. We're, automobile travel is peaking. You know, the, the amount of driving that people do, especially measured per capita, has peaked. Um, let me ask you this. Do you, do you, do you, do you own a car? I do. I okay. have, we, have, we have one car. Okay. So would you rather spend more time driving, more time in your car, or less time in your car? Certainly less. You would prefer to drive less? Yeah, I would. And I, you are normal. I, ask, I survey people all over North America. I ask, you know, are, are you a motorist or are you not a motorist? And pe most people say, I'm a motorist. And then I ask, okay, would you prefer to drive more or less? Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of people I talk with say, I would prefer to drive less, provided that walking and bicycling and public transit and taxi service and, and its variants like Uber are, are high quality, that we're improving our ability to get around without a car. And, and we live uh, out in Brentwood Bay. Yep. I work in Victoria. Right. I take the bus to Victoria. So right. uh, right. yeah, and, it's and a little you, diff different than Fairfield, though. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Sir. But it's all the, sitting on the bus, as you do every day sure. or most days. Um, can you think of some fairly cost-effective ways to improve the quality of service? If you, if, you ha if you saw some resources, could you envision, for example, nicer bus stops, uh, better user information? Certainly, um, yeah. Do the, do One you, could, so let me ask you this. Are the buses that you ride on ever crowded? They are. They're frequently Increasingly, crowded. That's right. Like this is one of the problems. I mean, it's a great problem to have. It's demonstrating that there are a lot of people who want to use public transportation, that there's growing demand. And, um, you know, you can look through at, at bus routes all over the region where um, there are, there's a lot of crowding. Uh, like I say, it's a good problem to have. Mm -hmm. It's fairly, compared with the cost of widening highways and building more parking facilities and accommodating more automobile travel, mm -hmm. it is far cheaper to operate more bus service. And yet the, the provincial government in particular has not given BC Transit, the, the operators, the funding they need to provide that additional service. In fact, the service is declining. The, the fundamental problem is while demand has been growing yeah. and improving public transit service yeah. helps achieve virtually all of our strategic goals. It reduces um, traffic problems and parking problems sure. and accidents and and that, I think that's what we're hoping for in Central Saanich is that, that sure. when that funding comes, sure. we can see improvements to service that's right. and, uh, and not just see the, the latest uh, uh, technological gadget well, sort of sure. sophistication. That's all great. And, sure. and don't get me wrong, there, there's some sure. amazing things that that's right. uh, are improved as a result. That's right. But, uh, I, but yeah. the amount of money you're talking about, the portion of total transit funding that goes into these innovative technologies sure. is actually small overall. I mean, it's probably probably not uh, more than a few percent of the total transit budget. And so if we want to achieve what I think is the rational transportation mm -hmm. investment, that is to ensure um, that, that people can get around with high quality transit and allow households to reduce their car ownership mm -hmm. and allow um, people who are, you know, the aging population in your in Central Sandwich to be able to continue to live here and not have to move to more, you know, more uh, transit friendly areas in order to, to, to reduce climate change emissions and to reduce traffic problems and all this stuff. In order to do that, we need more investment in public transit. Yeah. And, and right now that is, that's a major gap. Yeah. And so it, it has to be, the, the funding has to be of the scale that can actually achieve our strategic goals.
Fascinating. Yeah. And, and you mentioned rationality in the Focus magazine article. You mm -hmm. said, uh, I'll just read it. If we were rational, we would manage parking space more efficiently and free it up for affordable housing. Sure. Well, that is, well, the, the, the first step is that um, experts on, a, people who are experts on affordability are shifting the way we think about this issue so that instead of thinking of affordability only in terms of housing affordability, we, um, we measure uh, housing and transportation affordability together. So the traditional m measure was uh, housing was affordable if your, your household is spending uh, less than 30% of your budget, up to 30% of your budget on housing. Right. Um, but uh, cheap house is not truly affordable if it's located in an automobile dependent sprawled area where every adult in the household needs to own a car. So it is, uh, and on the other hand, a household could rationally spend more than 30% of its budget on housing if it's for a house in a walkable urban neighborhood where you don't have to spend as much money on transportation. So now experts are, are, are measuring affordability. They define affordability as a household is spending less than 45% of its budget on housing and transportation together. So that allows us to think about that together. So that brings us to this very interesting question because one of the, about parking, because one of the ways that one of the trade-offs is that conventional zoning codes force the cost of parking to be embedded in the cost of housing. So the zoning codes say that if you're gonna build a house or build an apartment building, that you have to have, and it depends on the location and some of the details, but somewhere between one and two parking spaces per housing unit. Right. Well, that's a huge cost. It's basically in, 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 um, in, for a very expensive house, for a million dollar mansion, um, the parking, those par the cost of the garage might only be uh, uh, five percent or, or, you know, five to ten percent of the house is devoted to the garage. But if you're talking about affordable housing, you're trying to deliver inexpensive apartment buildings or townhouses in an area with high land costs, uh, especially if it's, it's the kind of place where you're, you're building underground parking. So mm -hmm. the parking is, is dug under the building. The parking, those parking spaces cost twenty five dollars to $50,000 per unit, so per space. And so if the zoning code requires two parking spaces, it can be fifty dollars to $100,000 to satisfy those parking requirements. Mm -hmm. So, and it represents a, a large amount of land. So a lot of us are, are recommending a lot of, of, um, of urban, you could say it, urban planners or urban economists or people concerned about affordability or people concerned about um, smart growth, whatever, whichever term you're using, um, we're recommending that the way that, that we um, manage parking should fundamentally change. And instead of hiding the cost, instead of paying for parking indirectly, that we unbundle the parking from the housing. So right now, the zoning codes force people to pay for parking, regardless of whether or not they need those parking spaces. If we unbundle the parking, so instead of paying, let's say $2,000 a month to rent an apartment that comes with two parking spaces, and that's what that's what the current practice is. We say you rent the apartment for $1,800 and you pay $100 a month for each parking space. You're paying separately. Parking is never really free. The choice is between paying for it directly. That is, if you own a car, you pay for the parking space as a separate item, or we have to pay for it indirectly. And under current practices, we pay for most parking indirectly that hides the cost and it increases the cost of other goods, including housing. Hmm. Let me ask you this, what do you think, what type of land use do you think has the most generous parking requirement? On a, what, 
wh what Both land use has the most parking spaces per hundred per hundred square meters? In single family, no. Malls. No. What? Malls, shopping malls. What? Wait, what, what do we think? Bars and pubs. Oh, bars and I pubs read, and restaurants. I I read that. So on one hand, we're telling people don't drink and drive. Right, it's right. terrible. It's the worst thing you can do. On the other hand, our municipal governments are essentially saying, we're assuming anybody going to this bar is going to drive there. We're going to accommodate that. One of the questions that Central Sanch is going to have to ask, explore, is do you aspire to be a, a retirement area? Do you aspire to be the kind of place where if a family is deciding to downsize and you know they're looking for a house where they're, they're anticipating their seniorhood so they're saying not only are we retiring and you know our kids have gone so we're downsizing but we want to make sure we locate in a walkable transit rich area so when it's time to give up our driver's license we're going to do fine. Will Central Saanich and, and Brentwood Bay be those kind of neighborhoods. If you do, then things like affordable apartment buildings become with unbundled parking and yeah. elevators are going to become very key. So are you supporting? Do you, you know, if it, are there are there developers coming to Central Sandwich and, and Brentwood Bay that are proposing those kind of developments? You're a guy who's who's traveling the world talking about this, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I believe you said you're going to Laos uh, mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we doing then in this region? Your home, right? Are we the leader uh, that you would like to see us be, mm -hmm. um, or what should we be doing to right. become that? Well. Um, most, the good news is most jurisdictions are doing some good progressive uh, policies, reforms. Meaning municipalities in the CRD or you mean? Yeah, all okay. throughout the world. You okay. know. So there are, there are, there is progress to some degree. Uh, I think most planning professionals are, are understanding these, these basic principles that, for example, that um, the, the, the cost of parking is substantial and that there are some good things about reforming our parking policies. So you're probably facing it here. Do your planners um, suggest, are you seeing some recommendations for more flexible and reduced parking requirements? We see variances. Right, requests by the developers. Right, but, but uh, what would your plan too many say? times there's not necessarily something that is an exchange that results in people not having to drive a car. It's right, a variance, but, but let, let's say uh, if somebody was developing an apartment building in Central Saanich, are your, are you, is, is Central Saanich thinking about um, changing the minimum parking requirements for apartment buildings? Is there any discussion of that? Well, in as much as there are the variances that are granted for right. the proposal, the right. development. Okay. And where, where I come in is then to say, well, hey, are you including car sharing? Are you including right. uh, uh, bus pass with the right. development, et cetera? Right. Well, okay, so to answer your question, actually, Saanich is not a leader. Uh, Central Saanich. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Victoria is just now finishing up a major review of its parking requirements and they did something really interesting. It turns out ICBC has um, geocoded uh, vehicle registration data that basically identifies which building virtually every vehicle registered in British Columbia is parked at or is, you know, it's, it's home base. So ICBC was able to identify to tell the city of Victoria how many vehicles are actually registered to locate or located in particular buildings. And so they were able to very significantly reduce their parking requirements based on the actual numbers of vehicles owned in, in our typical buildings. But what's, what I, and so there's a paper, the latest paper that's posted on my homepage actually discusses or cr critiques that because I say that's great but that's still looking backward not forward so they used the vehicle ownership rates for different neighborhoods in um, 
in Victoria, and that's a great step forward, but it still is not anticipating the continual decline in vehicle ownership that we're seeing in central neighborhoods like Victoria and Fernwood and Fairfield, where these are the walkable urban neighborhoods where we're seeing this constant decline in the number of cars that are owned. Well, wow. no, that, that is very helpful, useful mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think, um, again, people can find out more mm -hmm. at your website, Victoria Transport Policy Institute website. Yeah, vtpi.org. Right? Oh, good. Okay, yes, thank VTPI. you. VTPI. Um, so, uh, I, and we hadn't even we haven't even talked about uh, car sharing and that concept. I'm, I'm hopeful that that will come out mm -hmm. to Central Saanich. I know that there's sure. a car at the ferries and most of the cars in the urban core area, but uh, it would be nice to see a vehicle in the Brentwood or Saanichton area in the sure. future. Um, but perhaps another time we can c touch on that. Um, but uh, what I'd like to say is thank you very much for coming on our show, Todd. Mm -hmm. It's been great to have you here and Heichke CM to you. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Great. That was awesome.